Welcome to RICO 12. My name is Justin, and I am a child of an all-powerful and all-loving God and a recovering addict, and am blessed to be the host of this meeting and podcast. RICO 12 is an organization with the mission of learning and sharing the similarities of addiction of all kinds and gaining and sharing tools and hope from others who are walking this path. We come together from all places, faiths, and backgrounds to gain tools and hope from others who are walking on this path. Speakers from our past meetings have represented so many fellowships, addictions, and afflictions, and we look forward to continuing to add to the diversity of speakers and backgrounds. Today's speaker for the 187th meeting is Trace B., who will be speaking on surrender and willingness, and we'll get to her talk and the Q&A afterwards in just a minute. First, for a little bit of business. Uh, the last couple of weeks, I have had a few of our email subscribers reach out and ask why they haven't been getting their emails and their week with week weekly links. And it turns out that their email company had marked Rico 12 as spam and sent the emails to their junk folder. So if you've suddenly realized, hey, I'm not getting the emails, whether you're here live, whether you're out there in the listening world, uh, check your junk email and mark Rico 12 as a safe contact so that you can get those reminders. All right. The Rico 12 family of recovery resources continues to grow and have more and more resources for the addict and the loved ones of those addicted. If you've not listened to any of the other Rico 12 podcasts, including Rico 12 Shares, Rico 12 Noodle It Out with Nikki M, and the Rico 12 Big Book Roundtable podcasts each come out weekly, I highly recommend that you check them out wherever you listen to podcasts. The links to those pod podcasts are in the show notes, and I'm putting them in the chat uh, periodically throughout the meeting. And I'm super excited about them and more to come. Your donations and subscriptions are making this all possible as there, there are costs to build and maintain them all. On that note, RICO 12 is a self-supporting service and we appreciate your help in keeping us working our step 12 in this manner. I want to thank a few of our spearheads and donors who joined the spearhead ranks this last week. Thank you to Stacy, Katrina, Dory, David, and Cheryl. Uh, we really appreciate your help in our mission to share this message with others. If you would like to become a spearhead and support RICO 12 in our mission, please consider going to rico12.com forward slash support and making either a one-time donation or becoming a monthly spearhead donor. We look forward each week to receiving from the light reflected from our speakers. That light inspires hope, meaning, worth, and growth in us, the listening audience. Now I'm going to introduce today's speaker for today, Trace B., Trace B is from Australia and is a member of Overeaters Anonymous. In, in Trace's own words, I came into OA almost two years ago after battling my, with weight my whole life. I was looking for a solution for a weight issue, and 12-step recovery has taught me that I have a life problem, and I use food and compulsive behavior as the solution. These days, I'm so grateful to be a compulsive eater and food addict. Trace, we're excited to hear from you. Take it away. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Justin. Really appreciate the chance to be of service. Hi, everyone. I am Trace B. I am a compulsive eater and food addict. And I say compulsive eater, but the truth is I am just generally compulsive. There isn't an area of my life that compulsive behavior doesn't filter through to. So um, just a little bit about me. I landed in OA in November 2021, so coming up to two years. I didn't come here to find a spiritual path in my life because I didn't think there was anything wrong with how I was living my life. I came into the rooms at over 300 pounds. I can't give you an exact number. <clears throat> Sorry, I can't give you an exact number because by the end I had stopped getting on a scale. I had scales that talked to me that I do truly believe and I mean, they do talk. It's a mechanical voice. They greet you. And then you get on and it gives you your number. And I believe that my husband and son must have run and ducked for cover anytime they heard the little voice say, I'm ready. Because that number dictated my life. If it was a number that I thought was okay, I was okay. If it was a number that disappointed me, oh my God. God help everybody because that now meant I'm either back on another one of my crazy, and I do mean crazy, restrictive diets and everyone get out of my way because I would be on a rampage of rage. But for me, that wasn't unmanageable. That was just life. So 
how did I come to be even looking for 12-step recovery? I come from a family of addiction and dysfunction And I really, really wish I could tell you that we're a family that seek help and talk about it. We're not. We're a don't ask, don't tell kind of family. And the big addictive players through my whole family are gambling, drugs and alcohol. And I always kind of patted myself on the back because the addictive gene just kind of skipped over me. I didn't really have issues with those things. I dabbled when I was younger. but when I decided that enough was enough, it was enough. And it's really hard to kind of sit on the wings of success when you look in the mirror at over 300 pounds and food is your driving force in life and not think, gee, I have the addictive gene of my family. It just presents differently in me because it's food, not alcohol. So as the years rolled on and I battled weight and food. I am very fortunate. I am married to a man who has been married and put up with me for 18 years. He has never been concerned about my weight. So it was never about what he needed me to look like. What brought me to these rooms as we went into our first lockdown here in Australia with COVID and the pandemic One of my younger cousins was in a coma in hospital. He's 10 years younger than me and in a coma from alcohol addiction. We were preparing for him to not survive and he survived. Came out of the coma and he drank. And it spread through the family like wildfire. Oh, my God, I can't believe he's doing that. And I thought, hmm. That's interesting. I had driven myself to emergency maybe a year prior thinking I was having a heart attack. It wasn't a heart attack. It was nothing. I got in my car, left the hospital and drove and bought McDonald's and ate in my car before I came home. And I thought, wow, he drinks like I eat. And I thought that self-knowledge of acknowledging I use food like the rest of my family use their addictive traits and passions, I thought that self-knowledge would be enough, that if I knew that I was an addict and admitted that to myself, I didn't admit it to anyone else, just to me, that would be enough. And it wasn't. I went on another crazy diet and I lost a bunch of weight. And then there was the day that I ate compulsively because that's what I am. I picked up what I now acknowledge are my alcoholic foods and it was all over. The weight was coming back on. I was back doing what I had always done with food and I have done horrendous things to myself with food. I have dislocated my jaw from excess chewing over days and I would love to tell you that stopped me from eating. I went to a physio and a chiropractor and got my jaw put back into alignment. I got back into my car and I ate instantly. There was no thought behind it. I went back to my addiction. I was in pain. I needed relief. So I ate. So As I said, I was on another crazy diet, my poor family putting up with the rage that comes with that because when you're severely restricting food and starving yourself, nothing about you is pleasant to be around. And I Googled one night sitting here, made a joke to my husband, wouldn't it be nice if there was a group for foodies like me, like there is alcoholics? He had a little laugh. I had a little laugh. He went to bed and then I Googled and up popped OA. And I thought, oh, my God, this is it. This is the relief I need. These people must have the best diet ever. So I turned up to my first meeting and I had a plan. I mean, at the time, I didn't know it was my higher power that had another plan, but I had a plan. I was going to turn up, keep my camera off because 
in my head, I'm so overweight, no one can see me, this is going to be so embarrassing. I turned up to this meeting and didn't realise that my settings on Zoom had my camera automatically turned on and I couldn't get it turned off quick enough and this lovely little meeting in Athens, Ohio greeted me and treated me with more love and I, I, I can't even, another word doesn't come, just the word love. They treated me with so much love on my arrival in that meeting that I genuinely thought these people are either some kind of crazy cult or they have genuinely found a way of living that is so different to mine. And I'll, I'll be honest, I was in so much pain and I hated myself so much that day that I thought, God, even if they're a crazy cold and these people are insane, some of them looked thin and most of them looked happy that I kind of thought, well, I can't be any worse than what I'm doing to myself. I was someone that thought my life was okay. I'm married. I run a business. I'm a mum. I'm nice to people on the outside. What I now recognize about myself, I was someone that was so full of rage that I would burn my life to the ground with my husband on a daily basis. Not gee, I was a little bit out of sorts with him or I snapped at him. No, no, no. I was downright mean to him all the time. I would be friendly to people outside of our home. I was the school mum, happy to do you a favour, happy to help you out to your face, then sit in resentment then chat to my husband and unleash at him, how dare these people think that I'm going to do this for them and who blah, blah, blah. It was an awful way to live. I was someone that would look in the mirror and honestly not have a nice thing to say about myself, to myself. I wouldn't speak to an enemy the way that I spoke to myself. The probably the the only thing I could have said that was semi nice about myself. I think I'm an okay mum. That was it. Nothing else. And if there was something nice that I ever thought, I then wrapped it back up in. But I don't know if I've just got my hair done and it's all brightly coloured and I think it looks nice. Look in the mirror. Oh, you've got nice hair. Shame the rest of you looks like it does. Shame you're not a better person. It was never a lovely thought about myself. And these people in this first meeting just treated me like I was a decent human being. And a lovely lady in that meeting gave me her number. We spoke after the meeting. I just said, I don't know what to do next. But you, what you all talked in that meeting, I am. I eat all day. If my eyes are open, my mouth was moving. I had to be chewing something, gum, candy, whatever it was, I am compulsive with my food. And she said, you just have one thing to do today. Don't pick up food that you know you can't have one bite of and put down. And I laughed and kind of went, well, that's all food. She said, it won't be all food. There'll be certain foods that set you off like alcohol does for an alcoholic. So I made a list of those foods. It was a long list of foods. And I have not eaten them since that day. I have been abstinent since my first OA meeting. The next day I went to another meeting because I didn't know what else to do. And I thought, well, those people made me feel so lovely. Why don't I just go to another meeting? So I went to another meeting. It was a newcomer's meeting. They, again, wrapped me in love and kindness. And that meeting is still a meeting that I go to every week. It was a group of people that genuinely loved me when I couldn't love myself and wrapped me in a higher power's love 
until I could find a little bit of love for myself. And I just did what these people told me to do, these crazy, crazy people who kept talking miracles and God and and I bristled every time someone said the word God because I was not here for that. I was in these rooms to get the diet, the fix, the magic potion, the magic pill, like an addict. There has to be a quick, easy fix for this little food problem I have. And I had amazing fellows that just kept telling me, be willing to do what you're told to do in this program. The thing that got hammered into me that first week, find a sponsor, find a sponsor, find a sponsor. So I did. Like any good compulsive person, I made a list of people that spoke at meetings who I thought would be perfect because I was about perfection. If you're going to do it, you're going to do it right. I was going to be the best sponsee anyone had ever seen. And so I made this and talked it through with my husband who has no 12-step recovery. God knows what I thought he was going to do, but I was just venting and it needs to be the perfect person. It has to be this. So I would make a list and scratch someone off because it wasn't right. And one person's name just stayed on the list constantly and after a meeting, an Australian-based meeting, because I am in Australia, she and I were both on, stayed in the Zoom meeting for a little bit longer. I got to know her a little bit, got off that meeting, rang her and asked her to be my sponsor, and she has been my sponsor since that day. I adore her. I don't know if she is a perfect sponsor, but she is the perfect sponsor for me. She sponsors me the way that I need to be sponsored. I need a little bit of freedom. I'm not, I don't do well when I'm told what to do. She doesn't tell me what to do. She, hmm, I'm wondering trace me regularly. And I love that because it's, it's guidance, not parental. And I, I work really well with her. And I remember that first phone call, was I willing to go to any length? Absolutely. I want what you have. I want what these people in the room have. The truth is I was willing to do what I wanted to do, not the things that I didn't want to do. There are nine tools in OA and I've written them down because I'm a little nervous and I knew I would forget one of them and that would just be embarrassing and you need to do things a little bit perfectly. So the nine tools in OA are a plan of eating, sponsorship, meetings, telephone, writing, literature, an action plan, anonymity and service. I was happy to do about half of those. I wasn't going anywhere near sponsorship. I wasn't picking up the phone and ringing anyone. I wasn't writing anything down and I wasn't doing an action plan. The rest I was okay with being of service. Yeah, I can do that. That will make people like me. If I turn up and I do service, people will like me because if you think I'm okay, I'm okay. So I willingly did the things I liked and left the things that I didn't like to the side. And I worked my 12 steps and I worked them with diligence because that's who I am. And as I worked the steps and realized that my life very much was unmanageable, that I was driven by self-will, that rage was my driving force, that I had no connection to something greater than myself. And I would ring my sponsor to say I'm struggling with, normally it would be I'm struggling with my husband. The man cannot fold a towel the way it needs to be folded and put in the cupboard. I don't know why, but he can't. I would ring her to to vent and she would, hmm, I'm wondering, Trace, how that might feel if you sat down and just wrote about it my God, what is it with 12-step people? You've got to write things down and journal. So I did because I thought I can't ring her again and complain about the same thing and have her tell me write it down and me say, I don't think so because I have never lied to my sponsor and I never will. So I had to journal. Then I had to ring her to say, 
oh my God, journaling, it's amazing. Does everyone else you know I know that if you write things down, it makes a difference? And then I thought, well, if writing and journaling made a difference, how would it be if I regularly made phone calls? Because that was the next thing. My sponsor told me to ring people. I wasn't going to ring people. And it wasn't because I didn't like the people in the rooms. I loved the fellows in the rooms. I thought I had nothing of value to give to anybody. And I just kept thinking, do what I'm being told, surrender to a higher power. And I did. I started making phone calls. I started seeing that I had something of value to share, not because I was the best OA anyone had ever seen or the best sponsee, just because I was being trace. I got a connection with a higher power. I believed my whole life in the power of the universe. I have a son with cerebral palsy and multiple disabilities and You genuinely cannot be next to a hospital bed with him in a coma from a two-hour seizure where you're being told we're not sure what this will look like, the other side of this. You can't sit there and not believe there is something greater than you that you can be begging for help. And my son, just aside to my OA, sorry, my son came out of that coma paralyzed on the left side of his body and I watched my then eight-year-old son will his body to move and it moved. He got up out of the bed two hours later and walked. Now he has CP so he walks a little differently anyway but he got up and he walked. Back then I would not have said miracle. I was just a oh wow. Now I acknowledge That's a miracle from a power greater than myself. So that was the same higher power that I harnessed for this program. I never thought my higher power, I I struggled with the word God. I can now use the word God and not bristle at it. For me, it's still a higher power. I knew there was a power greater than myself. I just didn't think that power cared whether I was fat or not. I just didn't. Now what I truly surrender to is my higher power doesn't care what the number is on the scale. My higher power cares about my spiritual health. My higher power cares if I wake up every morning and hate who I am and how I exist in the world. And that shift for me was genuinely life-changing. To realise that you have a power greater than yourself that genuinely loves you and is, for me, my higher power is gentle and loving. There is no punishment side to my higher power. To be able to harness that and genuinely change the way that I live my life. I was someone that heard people use the word miracle early on in program and I I just thought that miracles aren't a thing. There's no God or higher power is not going to shine a light on me and on the mountaintop of me singing and that that's not what the miracles look like for me. The miracles for me were being able to put down my alcoholic foods and not pick them up. My miracles are I pick up the phone and I ring a fellow because I want to be of service to them. A miracle in my life is when I now make an amends with my husband, it is a genuine I am sorry for my behaviour. And the sentence stops. Before OA, I'm sorry that I was awful to you, but if you're honest with yourself, you're a jerk and you set the ball in motion that made me be awful to you, so you should really apologise to me. 
that's what my sorry was. The miracle, the another miracle that probably as an OA and someone that battled with weight would be that I am a hundred and I want to say 30 pounds lighter than I was. I am a healthy body weight on a medical chart by any doctor. I am at a healthy weight. That should have been the lead miracle I told you about. It's not though. Because for me now, it is not about the weight. It is not about the number on the scale. It's that I am living my life with serenity. If someone had asked me before program how I was, my answer was always, I'm fine, I'm good, I'm okay. I was never going to ask for help. I was never going to be honest with someone. And the rare times when I was honest, my honest answer was, I feel like I am drowning. And people's reaction was always, oh, you'll be, you'll, you'll pick back up though, because I was the I'm okay girl. No one genuinely helped because no one knew how to help because I never asked for help. But that's how I felt. I felt like I was drowning. I feel like this program and 12-step recovery has allowed me to breathe. I now breathe. I don't think I breathed properly my whole life. Before I jump into situations now, I take a breath. If my husband says something that makes me genuinely roll my eyes, before I open my mouth, I take a breath. I didn't know I was holding my breath until I got into these rooms. And these rooms have taught me all I have to do is turn up, be willing to do the work and surrender to a higher power. I was driven by self-hatred and rage. And now I am driven by serenity and a love of a higher power that is all-encompassing. And that is a true miracle because I did not come here for any of that because my life was fine. I just had this small problem with weight and food. And it turns out I had a massive life problem and 12-step recovery genuinely saved my life. And I heard another speaker that, um, in a way, that said that 12-step recovery didn't save her life. It saves her life. And I so resonated with that because this is a one day at a time journey. And these days I am a very, very grateful compulsive eater and food addict and so, so grateful for 12-step recovery. And thank you so much for the chance to be part of the RICO 12 experience. So thank you so much for letting me share. Thank you, Trace. That was so good. So powerful. Thank you for your share. I really appreciate it. And there were several, I mean, I took notes like crazy and we've got some questions that are coming in from the live audience. We're going to get right into those questions. A reminder to those in the live audience who may not be aware, if you have a question for Trace, please type it in the Q&A link at the bottom of your Zoom window. Looks like two uh, speech bubbles over the top of each other. We'll get into some of those questions now. Let's start with someone from the live audience. This is from Chloe. Chloe says, where in the 12-step recovery process did you have to show the most willingness? Oh, um, when I started the steps, I thought step four, doing my inventory and talking about it would be the, the killer for me. And it wasn't that step four and five were a relief to me. Um, step six for me. Step six and seven, identifying the defects and then asking them to be removed. Who am I? If I am not full of rage, I will be an empty vessel with nothing to offer. That was the step that I, those two were the the steps that I, I say hesitated. I didn't think, God, I'm not going to do them because, you know, I'm compulsive. If I'm here, I'm doing the steps, but they, they were the steps that I, had to really rely on my sponsor and her guidance for how do I move through 
letting go of the defects that I thought were all that I was. I love that. And I'm going to follow up on that because that's one of the questions I wrote. You know, you talked about rage and you've and you've reiterated that here in this answer about how that was such a core part of your life, how you would um, take everything in and absorb it and be this perfect or at least happy person on the outside when you're in the community, but you come home and, and you take that out on those you love most. And I totally identify with that. How has that shifted and how have you made that shift in your own home and in your own life? I can honestly say I didn't make the shift. I couldn't. I Before program, I would hear my husband's key in our front door and think, just don't be a bitch. That's all you have to do. Just don't be mean. Just don't be mean. Don't be mean. Don't be mean. He would open his mouth and I would snap at him about whatever, well, you left a cup here or you did. It was never something serious. It was a minor thing that I would just react to. The shift didn't come from me. It came from the 12 steps, surrendering to a higher power, because I spent 18 years. Just be nice to the man who's nice to you. Be nice to the man that loves you no matter what you do. And I couldn't do it. I can say I was I never took my rage out on my son it was always directed at my husband but my son has noticed a shift because my husband and I aren't barking at each other all the time our house is calm all the time and that can only come from a higher power I had no power over that whatsoever that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And that goes into an, another question from our live audience. This is from an anonymous attendee. This person says, would you say you are now an emotionally sober and emotionally available person as a re result of the steps? And then they say, P.S. Your hair is fire. <laughs> Thank you. I love my hair as well. See, I can say that. I can say a nice thing about myself and not bristle at it. Um, oh, I am sober from the food. I am sober from my compulsive food behaviours. <sighs> Emotionally sober across the board, I'm still a work in progress. I, as I said, I am compulsive about everything. I am, as, for the people that can see me, I am fairly heavily tattooed because, you know, if you're going to get one, you're going to have 30 of them. I am working on being less compulsive across my whole life and and I definitely am less compulsive than I was. My emotions are much more regulated than they were. The rage doesn't erupt anymore and I use the word erupt because that's what it was. It was like a volcano erupting. Um, I'm fairly calm. 99% of the time. And when I do feel a shift, I come straight back to the steps. I look at my behavior, what my part is in it. I am very much less, what did they do to me? And more, what have I done to create a disturbance in my own life? I love that. And that kind of comes back to the, the, the person you quoted towards the end of your talk. The 12 steps didn't, they didn't save me in the past. They save me currently. It saves me. And I love that. It's a it's a progress, it's a work in progress. Thank you for sharing that. We got question more questions coming in. This is from Brandon. Brandon says, How do you define surrender? What does that look like in your day-to-day -day practice? Surrender was something that I struggled with because I am, surprise, surprise, a control freak who likes things done the way she likes them done. Surrendering for me came in small bits I, did, I, I I was never going to let go and not be the puppet master because you know how would the world survive if Trace wasn't in control of it so I let go of the little bits I learned to sit in meetings and it was okay if someone didn't read the exact words on the script Whew. and that took time because I was someone that was like hang on that's not right do it properly do it properly do it properly do it properly so for me, surrendering came in little bits and 
I still have to remind myself because I can sit in self-will for a day or two and then kind of go, wow, life's feeling hard. Oh, because I'm back in, surrender it, just keep letting it go. Thank you, Trace. And I think this next question kind of rolls into that really well. Um, this is from Sean. Uh, the person says, I struggle with controlling my kids. No is my first reaction to anything they ask for. Do you have any experience, strength, and hope on letting go of that control? The parenting one is, it's a whole other game, I i feel, for me. Um, I was a do it my way or it doesn't get done. And, again, it was in taking a breath. And I use the serenity prayer a lot. It was something that my sponsor suggested to me rather than reacting instantly take a breath say the serenity prayer in your head to give yourself time to make a calmer decision so I use the serenity prayer and I'm also branching into a second 12-step program that use a people version of the serenity prayer to stop my instant, they're not doing it my way. So yeah, serenity prayer, serenity prayer, serenity prayer. Love it. And I love how you're just kind of making these transitions into the next question so easily. You talked about branching into a second uh, 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 12-step program here. And this next question is all about that. This is from an anonymous attendee. I am a sexaholic in recovery, just over one year sober, and in the middle of mediating my divorce, I find myself compulsively eating in this very stressful time, and I'm worried that I'm also an overeater. Do you have experience with cross addictions, and how do I know if I'm an overeater in the in the addiction sense, or just using food as comfort in this very stressful time? Um, yeah. Uh, there, there's so many parts of that that I want to address. I have been a compulsive eater my whole life, and it for me, my history tells me if I if you have an addiction to it. My earliest memories of parties as a child, I picked my friends on whose parents cooked the best food. What parties had the best food? If there was a kid's party, I was at the food table keeping an eye on how much everyone else was eating. So I got my share. Um, for If you're not sure if you are, I would say come to an OA meeting. You'll know. You'll hear your story. You'll hear other people talk about it. Um, I'm not sure if Justin can give you my number, but I'm happy for Justin to provide my number to have a chat. But, yeah, come to an OA meeting. As for cross-addiction, yes, I have just moved into the arena of another 12-step program for families of dysfunction and addiction because I have done a lot of work in OA, but I know some of my behaviours and traits are much more family-based than just food addiction. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I also am one who, well, I'm a multiple winner. I'm in, in multiple fellowships and, uh, and yeah, I think my answer would, would coincide with yours. Um, attend a meeting of that fellowship that you fear or are worried that you're an actual addict of, and you'll find out soon enough. Um, nobody's going to diagnose you, but you, but it will come back clear. I am, or nope, I'm just a a heavy eater or a, an emotional eater, and I just need to manage those emotions. Either way, awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Trace. All right, next uh, question comes from another anonymous attendee. They say, I'm really struggling with my program as I can compulsively eat anything. If there wasn't ice cream, chocolate, crisps, etc., it would be carrots, absolutely anything. I'm struggling with the concept of cutting anything out of my diet, as the book tells me. I will be free from compulsive behaviors. And a way, measure, cut out, I still see me as trying to control. Any insights on that? I love that the word carrot was mentioned because uh, normally if I lead chair, I mention on one of my health kicks, I ate so many carrots, I sent myself orange and had to go to the doctor because I didn't know what the orange skin was and it was because I had eaten 
carrots so compulsively I actually set myself orange and it took about two months to for my skin to go back so I relate when people say god it's not like you'd been to eat plain rice well yeah if I can't get anything else like why wouldn't you binge eat that if that's what's in my house that's what I'll eat um what worked for me was taking the big players out of the game so removing the thing the things that I knew if I was going to walk into a shop and buy them to have what I would have called party day by myself when no one else is home they were the foods I took out first and removing those triggers made it easier to then sift through the rest of the foods to find out what foods triggered me and what foods didn't and taking out the big players made full abstinence and working my program so much easier for me. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, I really appreciate it. One of the strange, weird things that I noticed in that question is that everything that was mentioned there started with a C. And I don't think, you know, I'm not one that says that any food that starts with a C is an alcoholic food from that. But uh, I just found that interesting that everything that was mentioned there started with a C, cream, chocolates, crisps, carrots. <laughs> so anyways, thank you for sharing that. And Strange insight on my part. All right. We have a next question from a live audience member. This is from another Justin, not me, a different Justin. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story, Trace. At times, due to my character weaknesses, I find myself comparing myself with others in my fellowship, thinking I'm working harder than them, or they are working harder than me, or their story is more powerful than mine, etc. How have you dealt with comparison in a way where there, where there is a more physical component of recovery? As a sex and lust addict, it was easy for me to not let my addiction be visible to others. So what are your thoughts on that? That's a, a question that's fascinating because in even though it's called Overeaters Anonymous, it really isn't just overeaters. There are also severe undereaters, so anorexia, bulimia. Um, there's also exercise bulimia. There's a whole group that sit under the umbrella of OA. So in my first few meetings, there were lots of people that I was like, oh my God, look at how thin they are. Look at how healthy they are. It took a handful of meetings before I could really hear those people sharing. And I realized they were the other end of the spectrum to me, that in for me, in an OA meeting, you can, genuinely cannot judge someone on their appearance of whether they're healthy or not because they could be sitting there at a healthy weight, but it's because they're coming from the other side and they're actually unhealthy because they're anorexic or bulimic. So that, for me, made it very easy to let go of, stop comparing. As for the if my someone else's story is more powerful than mine, that's something that I have to surrender regularly. I remember the first time I got asked to lead share and I was going to write a speech and it was going to make people cry and make them laugh and it would be the best thing anyone had ever heard. I surrendered all that. I now start every meeting with a little prayer to my higher power. Let me leave my ego at the door. I am here to be of service. Help me carry the message to those who still suffer. I love that. And, you know, as one who, for whatever reason, has a voice, because I, I do this, I have this podcast, sometimes I, I am tempted to go, what can I say to ev evoke some emotion from the audience? But every time I try and consciously do that, I trip over myself. Um, I've got to give it to God. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate that, Trace. All right. Next question. Uh, this comes from another anonymous attendee. They say, uh, when you're cutting things out, like your alcoholic foods, what do you replace it with? And how do you get past the withdrawal and cravings? If I cut things out, my binges end up worse. I, I very much treated my alcoholic foods like an alcoholic treats alcohol. Not that I have experience with it from talking to other fellows who I know who are in AA. I took them out from that first meeting and I went through the detox and the withdrawal. And I'm always honest with my sponsees, getting abstinent nearly drove me insane. 
but I knew if I could get through that, I would stay in program and I would do the work. And I knew I had a fellowship and a sponsor to rely on and I prayed that the cravings would not last forever and they didn't. But I'm not going to lie, it is hard work coming through the detox and withdrawal of food or of any substance, but food is no different to any other substance. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I can only attest to that. Um, detox from anything but food. You know, we think, well, alcohol, I don't need alcohol to survive. You know, drugs, I don't need drugs to survive. Food, I have to eat to survive. And so in my mind, in the that that curious mental twist that happens says, well, I have to eat all of these, all of these foods. There's nothing else other than the things that I want to eat. But there's uh, miracles that happen when I am able to detox, as you said, avoid, abstain from those alcoholic foods and ingredients that are for me. And and the ones for you are likely different than mine. And the ones for mine are per- likely different than the person who's asking these questions. I, I've got to figure that out myself. All right. Next question um, from another anonymous attendee. So I So I can go to OA meetings even if I don't eat anywhere near enough. I've been looking for a solution for this aspect of my life, and I may have just found one. Thank you so much. Yes. And go ahead and expound on that, please, Trace. Um, yeah, as I said, it, it is over Eaters Anonymous. It really should just be Eaters Anonymous because, um, yeah, as I said, there's the I there's probably every kind of food addictive trait and compulsion in the rooms that I'm in. Um, some of my closest fellows are not binge eaters and restrictors like I am they're anorexics and bulimics so yeah I come to OA is my advice for that you will find people in the rooms there's even specific rooms for um under eaters uh different meet that we have meeting topics and groups so yeah definitely come to OA you will find your people Love it. Thank you for sharing that, Trace. I've just got a couple more questions here, and then we'll start wrapping things up in a few minutes. You know, you talked about the first meeting you went into where your camera was accidentally left on by you and people jumped in and welcomed you and felt made you feel loved. Um, how do you go about paying that forward with others who come into the room feeling as, oh, embarrassed, ashamed, uh, reclusive as maybe you felt when you came in? Um. At every meeting I'm at, if there is a newcomer or relatively newcomer, as soon as they identify, I will send a message to them in the chat just to say, welcome, remember feeling how you're feeling, here's my number, reach out anytime. If you want to give me your number, I'll ring you because I know how hard it is to make that first phone call. Um, I'm involved with a monthly newcomers workshop that we run on Zoom. So so for the newcomer and the not so newcomer, but I want every person that arrives at a meeting that I'm at to feel how I felt, that there was someone that cared. So I try to do that at every meeting. I love that. Is that newcomers workshop that you participate in every month? Is that something that you could share that link or that uh, an invite to that? So if people wanted to to attend that, they could contact me and I could get that to them. Um, I it, we it's my sponsor and I that run it, and the link changes each month. But I can um, I'm happy for you to give out my detail details to anyone that would like to attend, and each Perfect. month I can send out the link for it. Perfect. So if in, that's a lovely yeah, workshop. I love it. Love it. So if anybody um, wants to get in contact with Trace about that workshop or anything else, please email um, Rico 12 pod, R E C O one, two P O D at gmail.com. And I will get you connected with Trace. Awesome. Okay. And let's see one more question I have before going into the wrap up. And this is something that I found uh, very important in my own life. Uh, is that, you know, you said 
willing to go to any lengths. And then you said, no, I'm willing to do what I'm willing to do, you know, and, and the, the, the conversion from one to the other, from the willing to do what I'm willing to do to the willing to go to any lengths. What have you found was the key to that shift of mind of mindset of I'm willing to do anything I'm willing to do to going to, uh, I'm going to go to any lengths to make this happen. Working. It came from working the steps, getting that little bit of recovery as you go through each step. Cause the things I wasn't willing to do came from a very, I'm not worthy of anything. I was never going to sponsor because again, I had nothing to offer. And I sponsor, I have sponsored since the day I finished my steps because my sponsor wasn't going to allow me not to sponsor because you carry the message. So, yeah, it, it came, the willingness came not from me because I wasn't willing. My higher power just kept giving me opportunity and when I didn't listen, my higher power just got louder circumstances came where I was forced to do things that I didn't want to do because there was no other option and I didn't want to stay where I was. I didn't want to be in pain anymore. I didn't want to live how I was living. So I just kept picking up the next bit that other people kept saying that will help. Yeah. I love, and I love how your sponsor kind of goes, have you ever thought of, or what do you think about this? It's not a, it's not a direct direction, but you know, oh, well, this person, my sponsor is sharing their experience, strength, and hope that what works for them. And if it works for them, I better be willing to do it if I want it. So good. Thank you so much, Trace. This has been amazing. And I, I mean, there are other questions. If people have other questions that didn't get, that we didn't get to, we'll get to that here in a second. Before I close this out, Trace, though, do you have any final words of wisdom to share with us? Uh, I have nothing. Nothing wise, I don't think what I can say, keep coming back. I didn't do anything out of the ordinary. I just turned up and I did the work. If you do the work, miracles happen. And if you're in a program and you haven't gotten a miracle yet, hang around. And if you're not sure if you need to be in these rooms, turn up to a meeting of the fellowship you think you might be in. And you'll know. And at the worst case scenario, you're going to meet some pretty nice people. So, yeah, just hang around. Miracles happen in these rooms. Love it. Thank you so much, Trace. Um, everybody, if you have uh, more questions to ask, please consider going and joining our WhatsApp group. Um, you can join that WhatsApp group by sending an email to rico12pod at gmail.com. If you want to contact trace directly same thing send an email to rico 12 pod at gmail.com i'll make sure you get connected with her um this was a great meeting uh please consider coming back next week if you were inspired and want to share something of your insights in a 12-step type share please consider going to rico 12 share speak pipe link and record your three to four minute share there that links in the show notes of the podcast um uh, and you can do that there. If you've not yet rated and reviewed this podcast and Apple podcast, please consider going to do so now. It's a great way to work your step 12 and sharing this message with others. Next week, we look forward to hearing from Melissa T, whose topic will be, I am the problem and the solution. This should be a good one. Also scheduled for next Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. GMT is the Afro Euro Rico 12 meeting hosted by Karen A. The guest speaker there is Avital J. And that topic will be humility set me free. It's so cool to have all of these international resources going. I'm really excited about it. Now let's launch off into the rest of our day with the step three prayer that Trace will say for us. God. I offer myself to thee, to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Thank you so much, Trace. Remember all, there is one who has all power. That one is our higher power, your higher power. May you find that higher power now. Keep coming back. Let's trudge this road of happy destiny together. Work it. You are worth it. I've seen stars fall from above. I 
falling in without a love I've been high and I've been low Now I know I just can't do this on my own I've seen a boy become a man He got lost without a plan So far away from home Now I know And I just can't do this on my own Your arms surrounding me Your touch is grounding me No longer searching for purpose on Cause now I know just can't do this on my own I'm looking for the words to say You make the world a better place And I can call that place my home Cause now I know That I just can't do this on my own Your arms surrounding me Your touch is grounding me No longer searching for purpose on Stars fall from above I fell in and out of love I got high and I fell low But now I know And I just can't do this on my own No, I just can't do this on my own I can't do this on my own